Our first presenter is uh, Dr. Devraj Sukal. He's the Associate Director of BMC2 PCI. He's a clinical lecturer in the Department of Internal Medicine um, of Interventional Cardiologists at Michigan Medicine. And Dr. Sukal graduated from graduated AOA from Case Western Reserve University School in Medicine. He completed his residency in internal medicine at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts. Then he completed his general cardiology and interventional cardiology fellowships at the University of Michigan, where he also obtained a master in health and healthcare. Dr. Sukal's research interests include assessment of cardiovascular care quality, comparative effectiveness of cardiovascular therapies, and assessment of cardiovascular health care policy. You have met Dr. Sukal before, many of you, and um, we look forward to when uh, we can see all of you in person and you can get to know him better. But uh, take it away, Dr. Sukal. I might have one more thing I have. No, this is uh, Dr. Sukal's presentation, and he's going to explain to you the P2Y12 inhibitors and um, why we are asking you to track that uh, measure. Welcome, Dr. Sukal. Thanks, Kathleen. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, honored to be here and, uh, and echoing Kathleen's sentiments. Hopefully sometime in the near future, we can uh, all see each other in person. Um, as you know, BMC, one of the things uh, BMC2 is, is tracking is um, cardiology recommendations around uh, antithrombotic therapies, not only what therapy, but their specific duration. And, and hopefully over the next you know, 20 to 30 minutes, I can give a brief overview of the drugs themselves, but maybe more importantly about what's changed in the last decade and, um, in recommendations as well as research to, that makes this area complicated, particularly the duration of, uh, of therapy. Um, let's see, do I, am I, you're controlling the screen, is that right? Looks like, can you go to the next slide, please? If you control, would you can use your arrow keys? Oh, okay. Mm. There you go. All right, perfect. So um, this is the very brief overview of P2I12 inhibitors. Um, as most of you are familiar with, um, the drugs on the right-hand side of the screen, clopidogrel, prazogrel, and ticagrelor are, are the most commonly used ones. Diclodopine um, was, was used about you know, 15 to 20 years ago, fallen out of favor for a number of different reasons. And then cangrelor is an IV P2I12 inhibitor that um, has the, the great benefit of uh, fast onset of action, as well as um, uh, you can turn it off pretty quickly. And so this is sometimes used in, um, sometimes used when patients need to go to, um, need to go to cardiac surgery. So if you do a, an intervention, say a balloon angioplasty or something, uh, but ultimately you get them to cardiac surgery, we, we can use Cangrelor, um, but is, is not terribly uh, frequently used. On, on the graphic on the left, you can see that they're, they're all acting on the 2I12 receptor, which is on platelets and um, work to activate platelets, which then activated platelets are the ones that can then cling to other platelets, aggregate, form a clot, and, and uh, prevent bleeding, or in the circumstances of, of stent thrombosis, cause stent thrombosis. So that's why we um, target this receptor to pre ideally prevent stent thrombosis. So the benefits are, are obvious for the, in the setting of PCI, it's reduced the risk of stent thrombosis until stent endothelialization occurs. This is when kind of the body's natural cells start to cover the struts of the stent and, no, uh, and the, the foreign material of the stent is no longer viewed as foreign by the um, body's hematologic system. And then reduce overall risk of thrombotic events. Um, this is the reason why aspirin's frequently prescribed indefinitely, um, not necessarily to reduce the risk of stent thrombosis, but to actually reduce the risk of a recurrent myocardial infarction or stroke. And then the risks are obvious. They're, they're the same risks um, that come with the mechanism of action. So the risks in this circumstance would be bleeding. And so this is from the 2011 PCI guidelines almost exactly a decade ago. Um, and, and I won't go through it um, in detail. I won't read it verbatim. But what it essentially says is if a person's getting a stent um, for acute coronary syndrome, so a heart attack, they should be on aspirin indefinitely and some P2I12 inhibitor, clopidogrel, prazogrel, or ticagrelor for a, a year. 
if a person's getting a, a drug eluting stent for a non MI indication, they should get Plavix for a year along with aspirin. And then in patients receiving a bare metal stent, again, for a non MI indication, they should be given a minimum of one month, but ideally up to 12 months of a P2I12 inhibitor. In this case, again, clopidogrel. And then the, that, those are class one recommendations and weaker recommendations, 2A and 2B, seem to suggest that if there's uh, a reason that a person may be at extremely high risk of bleeding, or you know, as they state it in, in the recommendation number two under class 2A, if the risk of morbidity from bleeding outweighs the anticipated benefit, you can reduce the duration of P2I12 inhibitors to less than 12 months. And they don't really say much more beyond that. And then there's a, a generally vague um, recommendation as a class 2B of continuation of dual antiplatelet therapy beyond 12 months can be considered um, and they leave it at that. So relatively vague recommendations, but pretty simple ones if you want to kind of distill it down. Everyone should get aspirin indefinitely, and most people should get a P2I12 inhibitor for 12 months, and that's pretty much it. And this was kind of common knowledge for a long time, and then, um, you know, not unlike what, what happens in most of cardiology, we do a ton of trials and um, add some more nuance to the general recommendation of one year of DAPT. And you can see here, this is from 96, but really focusing on kind of 2011 onward. And this isn't even all the trials. I, I borrowed this from a colleague of mine. Um, there's a ton of trials just looking at antiplatelet agents, clopidogrel, prasugrel, ticagrelor. Um, and some of these are not only assessing the effectiveness of the drug, but frankly, assessing the um, effectiveness of varying durations of these drugs. And so this is the 2016 focused update on the duration of dual antiplatelet therapy. And I think the, the newer iteration that has yet to come out will be even more complex than this. Um, on the right-hand side where it says acute or recent ACS, so someone who's had a heart attack, it's still relatively straightforward. Everyone should get ideally 12 months of dual antiplatelet therapy, aspirin indefinitely, and one of the P2I12 inhibitors, regardless of if they get medical therapy alone, stents, lytics, or bypass surgery. Um, however, about 50, more than 50% of PCIs in the state of Michigan are done for stable ischemic heart disease, so stable coronary artery disease. And then you can see here after they undergo PCI, the, um, the branch point says at least a month of bare metal stenting. And then uh, they've reduced this recommendation from 12 months down to six months. So class one recommendation to have not 12 months of therapy, but six months of therapy. And that's primarily due to um, trials that one have demonstrated that this is safe. And two, the new stent technologies are thinner struts, less thick drug that's coated on it. And the, th the overall thickness of both the polymer and the stent are thought to play a pretty important role in the risk of clotting of that stent. And so given the newer technologies have really reduced those to ultra thin sizes on the order of nanometers, um, that's believed to be one of the major reasons why we can reduce um, the duration of dual antiplatelet therapy. I think the other reason um, that's been purported is really good um, medical management and secondary prevention of uh, of heart attack and stroke. And so that's high dose statin therapies, you know, in greater than 95% of patients in the state of Michigan after PCI, really good control, or at least attempting control of their blood pressure, their diabetes, um, and, uh, and ensuring that they're, they're taking aspirin as well. And so even within this, you can see that we've moved from this generic recommendation of everyone should get 12 months to, um, to a recommendation of bare metal stenting one month, non-bare metal stenting, drug eluting stenting in stable disease to six months. Um, but probably most importantly is, and I, and I think most clinicians are doing this, whether they do it formally or, or subconsciously, they're trying to balance the bleeding and ischemic risk of the patient in front of them. And these are criteria that are put forth by large kind of international consortia stating what are some risk factors that make a person a quote unquote high bleeding risk. Sorry, let me go back one. Um, and you can see here 
you know, anticipated use of long-term long -term oral anticoagulant, CKD, a hemoglobin less than 11, prior um, spontaneous bleeding requiring transfusion, intracerebral hemorrhage, um, liver cirrhosis, thrombocytopenia, low platelet count, and then some minor factors, moderate CKD, age being one, moderate anemia. Um, and so any one of these major, any one of these criteria in a patient makes them high, high risk for bleeding or any two minor criteria are kind of considered high risk for bleeding. And then balancing what's the risk of thrombosis or ischemia, um, whether it be early events such as stent thrombosis, um, things like if they got acute coronary syndrome, if they came in with a heart attack, they had stent thrombosis, um, they had a lot of arteries treated with a lot of stents or complex stenting like bifurcation stenting or long length of stents greater than 60 millimeters. And then long-term risks are related to risk factors. This is the long-term prevention of stroke and heart attack. So things like CKD, diabetes, multivessel disease, prior MI. And we ultimately get down to personalized medicine. The duration of DAPT likely should vary on that balance of a patient, an, in, an individual patient's bleeding risk compared or balanced against their thrombotic risk. And there are some calculators that have been developed over time. This is the precise DAP score, excuse me, which is developed out of Europe. Um, and you plug in a handful of different variables, including hemoglobin, age, white blood cell count, granting clearance, and they give you a sense of risk. And it may be hard to see on, on your screens, I'm not sure. Um, so I apologize for the, the tiny font. This is a, an example patient, not uncommon, of a 70-year-old with a hemoglobin of 11, so moderate uh, anemia, normal white count, and moderate CKD. And then they'd be classified as high bleeding risk. And this would be someone where, you, uh, at least based on this calculator, which is based on large uh, observational and randomized data, um, you could probably get away with shorter duration dual antiplatelet therapy, three to six months, rather than uh, 12 to 24 months. And without really a substantial loss in terms of an ischemic risk, actually the shorter duration group had lower cumulative incidence of ischemia, but, but probably more importantly, a reduction in bleeding um, by about 2.5%. Now, a lot of this is minor bleeding, so bleeding that's not requiring um, uh, transfusion or bleeding that's not requiring uh, surgery or, or um, you know, a five gram hemoglobin drop. But nevertheless, it's still bleeding, often requiring hospitalization or, um, or evaluation. And so this is comparison of short duration versus long duration. It gets, um, unfortunately, even more complex. I think it's not moving forward. Oh, let's go back one, there we go. And then this is personalized medicine for long duration. There was a trial, I believe from 2016, um, yeah, 2015 or 2016 called the DAPT trial. And that's where they um, compared 12 months versus 30 months. So essentially asking the question, are there, is there benefit to maybe even going longer with dual antiplatelet therapy? And out of this came essentially, um, you know, the study essentially demonstrated that some people could cause some increased risk of bleeding, but in others, it could really substantially reduce their risk of, of an ischemic event, be it stroke or, or heart attack. And out of this came the score called the DAPT risk calculator, which is published by the ACC. So is it um, a US trial? And on the left, you punch in a, a handful of different variables, age, um, diabetes, prior MI, hypertension, peripheral artery disease. You type in some characteristics of the procedure itself. Was it done for an MI? Was it a vein graft that was stented? Was the stent diameter greater, greater than or less than three millimeters? And you can get on the right a kind of a balanced a predicted risk of what would happen if you stop at 12 months versus if you continued beyond 30 months. And so I actually frequently use this, um, given that, you know, sadly, I, I sometimes have some relatively young, otherwise healthy appearing patients coming in for a heart attack. And uh, if, if they get to 12 months with, with aspirin and ticagrelor or aspirin and Plavix, um, I'll then have a conversation after punching in numbers in this risk score about whether we continue for longer of uh, usually aspirin and Plavix, that's what the trial was. Um, so I'll switch their, their Ticagrelor or Prazogrel to Clopidogrel at 12 months and then continue that for, you know, another, um, another 18 months or so. So, um, you know, I, I think whether we do this formally by pump, punching in the numbers in a calculator versus doing it informally and kind of using our gestalt, I think most clinicians are probably um, 
making this decision. And this decision, as I noted, is complex. And, and that'll, that'll be why um, uh, I'll get to in kind of the final slides, why it's so important that these recommendation, recommendations are at least explicitly stated as the initial thought for the plan for antithrombotic therapy. And I use the term antithrombotic rather than antiplatelet therapy, because what about oral anticoagulants? You know, so many of our patients who are undergoing PCI have atrial fibrillation, um, you know, substantially less proportion have another reason for anticoagulation like, like DVT or PE. Um, but nevertheless, you know, in the past, we didn't really know what to do with it. We, in many circumstances, this is kind of prior to 2011, many circumstances, we just do triple therapy and hope, hope that they wouldn't bleed. Um, I think this started changing with, with this seminal trial published in 2013 called the WOEST trial out of, the, out of Europe. And they essentially asked the question, um, use of clopidogrel with or without aspirin in patients taking an oral anticoagulant predominantly warfarin at this time since the trial was done around the 2010 period and undergoing PCI um, an open label randomized control trial. And they essentially demonstrated that um, triple therapy is harmful and that uh, warfarin plus Plavix uh, does just fine in terms of uh, equivalent ischemic events and a substantial reduction in bleeding complications. Um, and this really uh, changed the game. Uh, not only because it changed how we would manage antithrombotic therapy in patients uh, in AFib who underwent PCI, uh, but also because newer novel anti oral anticoagulants were coming out, um, be it dibigatran, rivaroxaban, apixaban, more recently adoxaban. Um, and you can see here, uh, you don't have to get the details out of this slide, but it's simply demonstrating that in multiple different trials, Pioneer using rivaroxaban, um, Redual using dibigatran and Augustus using Apixaban. And they have some, some nuances to their trial designs that are, are probably uh, not important. But generally, that come to the consensus that um, triple therapy, or at least for any substantial period of time, um, is, is high risk. And so this is from the 2021 expert consensus statement um, just came out in circulation about what to do with antithrombotic therapy in patients who have atrial fibrillation. And so the default strategy here, this is kind of assuming they're at moderate to low risk for bleeding and ischemia or equivalent risk of bleeding and ischemia um, or th a thrombotic risk. The default strategy is to do triple therapy. So aspirin, Plavix, oral anticoagulant uh, around the peri-PCI period. So many people just say around the time of the hospitalization, you know, two, three days, um, I'll give you an example on the last slide and certainly we'll leave some time for questions um, if there are particular uh, examples that you wanna discuss. But after doing triple therapy for just a couple of days and in the WOAS trial where warfarin was the predominant drug, they didn't even wait for the INR to become therapeutic before they dropped the aspirin. They would do aspirin and Plavix, start warfarin. And after two, three days, they would just drop the aspirin and do warfarin and Plavix. Um, in this situation, you, you would do triple therapy for a couple of days and then do double therapy, oral anticoagulant plus a P2I12 inhibitor for up to 12 months, and then an oral anticoagulant alone. In the next line where patients are at high ischemic risk and low bleeding risk, so the risk of a future clotting event, be it stroke or heart attack, is greater than their, their bleeding risks, they suggest potentially doing triple therapy for up to one month, but really not a lot of strong data for that extra you know, couple of weeks then doing double therapy for 12 months of an oral anticoagulant and P2I12 inhibitor, and then oral anticoagulant alone. Um, and notice that in, there are other trials that I'll go beyond uh, that kind of I didn't include in this slide set, but simply demonstrate that after 12 months, if you're on an oral anticoagulant, you probably do not need aspirin kind of underlying it um, in terms of kind of stable coronary disease patients. And then patients at low ischemic thrombotic or high bleeding risk they recommend triple therapy for just a couple days and then double therapy for up to six months. Um, so can be kind of safely reduced from 12 months to six months. There are even newer trials um, suggesting that you can put a drug eluting stent in and stop dual antiplatelet therapy after one month and that either continue P2I12 monotherapy, so say Plavix alone or aspirin alone. 
Um, and more and more of those trials are coming out, um, particularly in elderly high risk patients. Um, and I can I have some personal examples of patients of mine who I've just treated for one month after putting in drug eluting stents and you know, knock on wood have, have so far done fine. And so our uh, best practice protocol and subsequently our, um, our recommendation to our physicians and our sites is uh, given the complexity around antiplatelet and anticoagulant therapy, um, not only what drugs to choose, but the duration to use them is complex and, and frankly, very, quite nuanced. Even the guidelines um, kind of uh, acknowledge that. Um, the last bullet here, the duration of DAP to be determined by presentation as well as a discussion around bleeding and ischemic risk. The interventional MD should make and document an initial minimum duration of antithrombotic therapy, i.e. specify the DAP plan. And we think this is important because one, um, I'm not even sure all interventional cardiologists know the abundance of data that's come out as well as the change in guidelines and expert consensus, let alone our general cardiologists and certainly our primary care physicians. And, and frequently our general cardiologists and primary care physicians will be looking to our interventional MDs, particularly the ones who place the stents to help with this, um, with this uh, decision about, about duration of antithrombotic therapy. Now, obviously the duration can change based on whether the patient has a bleeding or recurrent ischemic event in that time period. But at least starting out with an initial minimum duration, um, I think is, is important um, for the care, long-term care of the patient. And so what the recommendation should look like, these are just examples, obviously they can be anything as long as they convey the correct information. But for someone with stable CAD non-ACS, recommend aspirin 81 milligrams daily indefinitely, recommend Plavix 75 milligrams daily for at least six months. Um, and you can write at least six months because hopefully someone is following them up at six months and then making a determination about whether they should go to 12 or 30 months based on those, those risk benefits. And then for ACS, recommend aspirin 81 daily, recommend ticagrelor, for example, in this case, 90 milligrams twice daily for at least 12 months. And that's um, you know, obvious where the benefit uh, lies for ACS patients. And then a patient on oral anticoagulant for stable CAD. This is a little bit more complex because if this is truly going in the interventional note, um, this is what I usually write. I'd say recommend aspirin 81 daily for 48 hours until apixaban is restarted. That's usually when we restart it femorally or, or within 24 hours if we go radial. And then recommend Plavix 75 daily for six months and recommend starting apixaban in 48 hours and continuing lifelong. If apixaban is held at any time, please discuss restarting aspirin with the patient's cardiologist. Um, and this is an example of a person who, who would be at high bleeding risk. And thus I reduce the duration of of clopidogrel from 12 months to six months. I think that's it. Any questions? Uh, I, I know uh, we're running a little short on time, uh, but the, I think uh, there's a lot of information to cover. And I think the, the nuance around this decision is important and it and really drives the rationale for why we think the recommendation should be explicit. I don't see any questions in the chat yet, uh, Dr. Sukal. I appreciate you tying everything together. Thank you for the uh, sure. wonderful presentation to show why, knowing why you're doing something um, is very important. It helps to motivate you. In 2022, we're going to be restricting the coding. It, um, yes, for this measure to the procedural report. Um, that our rationale, I know our rationale, um, and I don't know if you have a more eloquent way of stating that we want to, that's the piece of, that's the document that follows that patient around. Is there a nicer, more concise way to explain that to our clinicians, why we are emphasizing? Uh, the clinicians on the physician call for P4P, &P are that that's who pushed that this needs to be on the procedural report, not some generic stuff at the charge, that kind of thing. Um, is there a more eloquent way um, to state that from a clinical perspective, why it's important to have yeah. it on the procedure report? Yeah, that's, it's, a, it's a great point. You know, I, I, think, um, I think there are a couple of reasons. One is the procedure report is frequently under the direct discretion of the provider that implanted the stent. Um, and, and like I said, at, at a bare minimum, they should be the one kind of deriving the risks and benefits of high bleeding risk versus high thrombotic risk and what that anti, they can obviously do that in consultation, but I think 
as a starting point. I think that's one reason. The second reason is just from a documentation standpoint. If there's one place that we can state it should be, it could ideally then streamline where that one recommendation can be found rather than, you know, I think a lot of um, physicians on the call were saying, you know, we put one recommendation here, but it's a different recommendation in the, you know, the, the next day's inpatient progress note. And it's a different recommendation in the, in the discharge summary. And so at, le I, at least some uh, uniformity there, I think would be helpful. And starting with the procedure report as being the location to find this. And I, I think if you do it long enough, just at every institution, if you, if you do it long enough, folks will know that that's where that recommendation can be found. Um, you know, I, I know for, for our institution, for the longest time, we'd put our hydration protocol in the recommendation and we'd put, um, you know, some, some better than others, the duration of antiplatelet therapy. And the next day, you know, lo and behold, you would find it in the progress note taken from the recommendation that was put in the procedure note. So I think it does have some utility. That's one and two. Many times our, our um, especially with, a lot of sites using Epic or at least electronic health systems. Many times our primary care providers or general cardiologists in the outpatient setting will be looking um, for the procedure report to see what happened and hopefully find the recommendation there. So does the have, oh, yeah, sorry. go ahead. I thought you were done. I'm very sorry. <laughs> no, 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 I'm done. We had a question um, come in and I don't see from who on my screen, but uh, does the recommendation of the type of P2Y12 have to be specific? It seems to me all P2Y12s have the same duration recommendations. So the name of the drug, the type yeah, of versus the clopidogrel, that yeah. kind of thing. That's a good question. And that's from you know, Dawn Light. Now I see your name. Thank you, Don. <laughs> Don, that's a great question. I, 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 think, um, I think from a duration standpoint, it's potentially less important. However, I think specifying the P2Y12 inhibitor is quite important, um, somewhat independent of the duration. And, and the reason I say that is for any high, high bleeding risk patient, the recommendation is to not use ticagrelor or prazogrel. So if there's a recommendation to shorten the duration um, because they're high bleeding risk, but that recommendation is shorten the duration, but use ticagrelor, it can seem somewhat dissonant in terms of, or contradictory in terms of why you're, you're shortening the duration. So I do think it, it is important. Now, with that being said, uh, and maybe maybe you're alluding to this, with that being said, frequently, let's say I'll do a PCI for an MI and I'll prescribe Ticagrelor in the cath lab and I'll put it in my report. And the next day I'll get a call from the inpatient team saying, hey, after one month, this person's cost is $180 a month. They're not gonna be able to afford this. Well, then I'll, then I'll suggest either transitioning to Prazogrel or Clopidogrel at that time um, or transitioning after one month, which we'll frequently do um, in our post-PCI clinic. Um, but nevertheless, I think that initial duration will often still read what I initially thought, which was Ticagrelor and that, and at least provide the rationale for, um, for the recommendation. But I, I, that is a scenario where the discharge summary may look different than the procedure note, and probably for good reason, as long as it's explicitly outlined. You're muted, Kathleen. I'm sorry, I do that because I have rambunctious pups. Um, Leslie Mayer from Huron Valley is asking, may the cath lab nurse hmm. practitioner make recommendations to meet BMC too? Yeah, good question. You know, I personally don't see, a, I personally don't see an issue with, um, I guess, who makes the recommendation in the pipeline of the cath lab. You know, we all work as a team and I think different sites have different personnel doing different aspects of the care. Um, that's provided. And if, if your institution, uh, you know, has the NPs make those recommendations or make them in consultation with the provider who's implanting the stent, then I think that's fine. Um, that's my personal opinion. I, I think that that would hold as long as it's, you know, again, a, uh, as I think most sites are doing, a thoughtful decision made around the, the DAP, th the antithrombotic therapy and their duration, and that's documented accordingly. So do nurse practitioners typically document on the procedural report, Leslie? I think that's where our um, hindrance is. Uh, that's where you're not going to meet with that because I think the providers write their reports and the nurse practitioners will sometimes write recommendations afterwards, like in a progress note. So if they're writing in the report, that um, I don't know the process at your institution. So. But 
like yeah, I think if it, yeah, yeah, if it has to be in the report, usually the provider who did the procedure either writes it or or ultimately signs it, um, and so they'll they'll kind of be responsible for ensuring that that recommendation is not only there but accurate. Yeah. All right. Let me see if there's anything else. Uh, a couple. Uh, Rebecca and um, Mary Lee are thanking you for the awesome presentation. You're welcome. And Thank you. Thank you guys for the opportunity. Let's see. Oh, and Leslie's saying they do a post procedure orders. So yeah. that is not what we're talking about, Leslie. We're talking about a, a direct statement, like what you saw with Dr. Sukal's examples. I say this for this long, then drop them down to, the, you know, what the initial plan mm -hmm. is. So, but that's a good question because a lot of people are going to, you know, run into that type of uh, scenario. So are there any other questions for Dr. Sukal? All right, I don't see any coming in. Um, thank you again. Um, I know I have a better understanding of pulling all those studies together because you keep seeing, and I would see anywhere from three months to 24 months and um, like Don yeah, said, I, for different medications. So it was confusing. Yeah, I think this this area is gonna be ever changing and, and I more likely than not, we're gonna see more and more recommendations for shorter duration therapies, um, which, which is, uh, I think a welcome change in many circumstances, given the the hindrance of taking DAPT, you know, not getting surgeries and stuff like that. So um, anyway, thank you for the time. I know you guys have a, a packed uh, rest of the meeting, so I'll uh, I'll leave you to it. Thanks again. Thank you, Dr. Sukal.